Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 216 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Mike Listener about the Free Law Project. Today's podcast is brought to you by Podium, Gusto, and Case Text. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So we just published a new Lawyerist Lens video, which is findable on YouTube or the front page of our website. And the most recent video is a little discussion by Sam on the concepts of technology versus innovation. (laughs) Um, And I'm curious, without being redundant for the content of the video, if you wanted to tee up what your thesis there is, and then maybe talk a little bit about some of the other things people can find through our video series. Sure. And actually, this came up in the podcast I just recorded with upcoming podcast guest Rachel Rogers, where we were talking about, you know, just slapping technology on things is not innovative. If you don't change the way you do things to take advantage of the technology, you're just doing things on higher tech tools in the same old way, and you're not really getting an advantage out of them. Totally. That's a sample of the kinds of things you can get from our YouTube channel. If you haven't been to our YouTube channel, check it out. There are almost a year's worth of Lens episodes. There are dozens and dozens of overviews of different products where you can get in bite-sized format our thoughts on how it works, what its features are, and who it's best suited for. Check out the YouTube channel, and while you're there, please subscribe to the channel. There's also a little bell button that you can hit if you want to get notified when we release new videos, which we do a couple times a week. Or as an alternative, you can view all of these same videos on Facebook through the That's little right. the little video icon at the bottom of your Facebook app. Yeah. Lots of ways you can consume our video. Hit the thumbs up while you're there and give us a like. That helps other people find the show. So check in with that now and then. Now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Jake Heller from Case Text and then my conversation with Mike. Hey, I'm Jake Heller. I am the CEO and co-founder of Case Text. We are a legal research company that uses artificial intelligence to help you find the best cases and other authorities fast and easily. Hey, Jake, welcome back to the podcast. And today we want to talk about some tips for getting better prices from traditional legal research providers if you're not quite ready for case text yet. So what are some of the tips that you've got for doing that? So happy to share them. By way of background, by being in this industry, we've come across a lot of different information about how much people are paying with the traditional and legacy legal research providers. Yeah. And one thing that shocked us was that even for pretty similar legal research packages, you might be looking at costs that vary between $1,200 a month per attorney at the firm, all the way up to $14,000 per attorney at the firm. And that kind of variance, you know, and this happens because uh, a lot of these contracts are, are secret. Yeah, they don't publish their prices. They don't publish their prices and they, and they make you sign an NDA. And I think that while that is being used right now to make sure that prices stay relatively high, There are a lot of ways to get around these high prices if you're not quite ready to look at other options. Yeah, very cool. So there's kind of three quick tips on that. One, you can negotiate. We're all lawyers. We went to law school. We negotiate settlements. We negotiate uh, fees with our clients. We probably negotiate with our spouse more than we should. (laughs) And so you can use that same skill to bring down the prices. And I would say the number one piece of advice I have while negotiating is have leverage. Right? If one of these traditional research companies thinks that you need them, then they can charge you whatever, you know, and, and they'll think you'll have to pay it. But if you make it seem as though you don't need them, you can go to an alternative, you can restrict the amount of content, you don't even use them that much, then they'll be willing to come to the table. And use the fact that you you are dealing with an individual salesperson to your benefit, right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and get the best price you can. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is to consider limiting the scope of the coverage of your research contract. So what we've heard out in the market 
is that folks who tend to have a more restricted coverage, for example, just the cases in their state or just the cases in their state and the federal courts tend to pay less than your $14,000 contract that includes treatises and, and a lot of other bells and whistles. Yeah, it, it comes with a risk, though, and that risk is twofold. A, if you click on something outside of your contract, you might get a surprise bill at the end for $1,500 or more, and you might be left thinking, why didn't I just you know, get more content to begin with? And B, if you restrict the amount of content you have, you may actually be putting yourself at a disadvantage compared to opposing counsel. If you're up against lawyers from firms of all sizes or the government, and in fact, in front of right, a judge that may have you know, a full database to, to one of these research providers, they may have arguments based on analogies to other precedent or to other sources that you aren't going to be able to have access to, and that may put you at a disadvantage. So that's something to think about. Uh, but for many practices, it's okay to restrict the amount of coverage, and you'll get by just fine. Tip number three is consider actually making a switch. Today, more than ever, there are alternatives that vary in terms of pricing and coverage and capabilities. I'm biased. I'm the CEO of k <laughs> and I think that our $65 a month, you know, and even, even less if you're a lawyer's member with a special offer, right? I think that's a better deal. It gets you all cases, all statutes, all regulations, articles, briefs, et cetera. But there are other options, too. Consider checking out Casemaker or Fastcase, especially if it comes free with the bar, right? And these options will be transparent about their pricing, transparent about what they cover, and it may not be for everybody, uh, especially if you need Lexis or Westlaw specific bells and whistles, but they they might be for you. And so, you know, it might be time if you're looking to save money to, to check out alternatives. So if you want a great deal on Case Text, you can visit casetext.com slash lawyerist and you'll get a 14-day free trial and 15% off. We'll throw that link in the show notes as well. Jake, thanks so much. Happy to be here. Thanks for taking the time, Sam. I'm Mike Listener. I'm the executive director of Free Law Project. We're a small nonprofit out of the Bay Area in California that's working to gather and curate and share as much legal data as we possibly can. Hi, Mike. Thanks for being on the podcast. When you say as much free legal data as you can, what kinds of things do you currently have? We have a bunch of things. We've been doing this now since 2009 in one form or another. And when we first started out, we were focused really heavily on opinions and making up a really good database of opinions. And that includes, you know, both the published ones and the unpublished opinions and try to get citations and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Since then, we've moved a little bit towards doing a lot of work with PACER data. Uh, And so our PACER data now is easily our largest collection of data. We host the Recap Archive, if folks have heard of that, and uh, it's got something like 50 or 60 million items in there now. And then our third big collection is oral argument recordings. We have, I believe, the biggest collection of oral argument recordings, at least in the United States. And that's the court listener collection. Yep. And that's all that's all on court listener. Yep. Very cool. And when you say collecting it, you know, w- within your world, I think what you mean is fairly clear. But I think what you're doing is you're basically providing a database of information in a structured format and then with the idea that other projects that need to make use of it can access it. There's no like a search box where one of our listeners can just go and search to find a case, right? Uh, no, we, we have. If you go to courtlistener.com, you can, you can search the cases. Uh, you can search the recap archive. That's always been something that we wanted to do because we mm-hmm. actually started out just doing alerts. Yeah, I guess you do have a front end. Yeah, if you want okay. an alert system, then you got to do a uh, search. But you're right. A big part of what we do is sharing the data you know, with law firms and researchers, journalists and uh, startups, all kinds of different organizations. I mean, that was, I think, always a source of confusion for people about public.resource.org, Carl Malmood's projects, which are, there's no front end for it. And so it was always kind of, it's hard to see what's there or understand why it matters when a normal person can't actually access it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, You know, Carl has done a ton here and we actually ingested a lot of the work that he's done but, you know, what he did, he just went and started sending, I think, books to, you know, to Asia somewhere where they mm-hmm. were 
the case law was just typed up into a really nice HTML and, uh, you know, they pulled out the metadata <laughs> and it was just, I think he had each volume was sponsored for, I think for a thousand bucks or something like that. Wow. Um, to, to get somebody to, to type it and then they'd have another person type it and they'd, you know, compare the difference to see, you know, if there was any typos. It was this huge project, but you're right. In the end, what they had was a bunch of HTML pages. They weren't searchable. You could look up a citation, but it wasn't like a research platform. It was a way of spurning innovation, right? Well, say more about that, because I think, especially from the perspective of a lawyer who probably has access to some kind of a legal research database, it's not always apparent why it matters that there are all of these other people trying to build repositories of case law and commentary and statutes and things like that. And it feels kind of like a messy thing, right? There's like a mess of different people doing it out there. There's publicresource.org, there's Court Listener and, and Free Law Project, there's Justia is doing some things like this. It feels like there's a lot of stuff out there and it's hard to know what's worth paying attention to. So why does it matter and, and why is it so messy? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, I think you sort of have to go back. Like, I like to look at things from sort of the, the whole historical perspective as much as possible. And, you know, like we started with books mm -hmm. and wh whoever, <laughs> whoever went down to the courthouse and, you know, got the content and put it in a book and sold the book. That was the stuff you had and your law firm might have a library or you might go to a law library to get content. And that was what you had. That's not a great situation. And obviously the Internet makes it better, right? I suppose it's easy to see why a book is something that is rarer and why it is worth something because paper and glue and stitching and leather all cost money. And so it's easy to see why the book has value and needs to be stored somewhere and can't easily be duplicated. It's a little different when it just comes to the data that's on the pages, right? Yeah, that's that's right. So um, it's a little bit like Wikipedia, right? Before mm -hmm. there was Wikipedia, like we had all this knowledge in these books, if you could get the book and we we're like, let's just write it down and put it online and then everyone <laughs> will have it. And so we did. Right. And now we have Wikipedia. And if you have any question about almost anything, there it is. Right. Why are zebras striped? Why? <laughs> you know, it's all it's all there now. And you never have to suffer long with the question to which you don't have the answer. <laughs> right. And that's incredible. You know, I have two kids and this is the world they grow up in. They know everything as soon as they want to. It's crazy. Yeah. And so what we're doing is a little bit like that, right? Like what Carl is doing at um, the resource.org, what they're doing at Justia, all, all of these people that are working in the free law world. It's trying to solve that same sort of a problem where the primary sources are digital and they're online and anybody can access them. If you're a startup or an individual or a four year old that wants to look up you know, some arcane legal matter. It's all there, <laughs> right? And so that that's a lot of what we're working on. And that's the, sort of the distinction between like, you know, uh, what resource.org did is they, they just gathered that raw material and, and now we can innovate with that. I, I guess that leads me to the next piece of it. Projects that are aiming to be open um, have a tendency to result in mess, right? Like in the same way that, you know, there's one Windows operating system, there's, there's one current Mac operating system and there are 10,000 Linux distros. <laughs> you know, there's there are basically two or three major legal research private platforms, and it feels like there are dozens of smaller repositories of the law at various degrees of completion. Um, is that a feature or a bug or just a way that things work when you make them open? Well, I, I think it's worth pointing out that nobody knows what's in Westlaw or Lexis, right. first of all. <laughs> nobody um, except subscribers, well, and even then, who knows? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know when you search for something if it comes up, but you don't know about the stuff that they don't have. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think they're immune from being lumped into this as well. Sure. Yeah. And there are academics that have like gone into Pacer and they've pulled down cases that they thought were relevant. And they said, okay, what of, of these that I know exist in Pacer, what's in Westlaw, what's in Bloomberg, what's in Lexis? And the coverage, you know, sort of the reputation that you'd think they'd have is like, oh yeah, everything's going to be in everything. But hell no, right? Like mm -hmm. um, it's remarkable how much of that content is not in each of those providers that we consider complete. That's my rant about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but to get, get to your question about like, you know, sort of, uh, is it a bug or a feature? I mean, I, I think it's a bit of a bug, right? Like in a much better system where like Pacer was open and state courts were doing a great job publishing content and, you know, the data was easily accessible. Everyone would have the same content 
and it would be great. I mean, is Canada a model for this? Like Canly is kind of, my impression is that everybody just sort of uses Canly to access Canadian statutes and opinions and things like that. And I wonder if as a result, maybe there aren't, you know, a bunch of mirrors out there or different databases, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. That, that's kind of my <laughs> understanding too, but I've had my hands so full with the American legal system that I right. barely pay much attention to the other uh, other countries. Well, let me ask. So, so we've talked about kind of what are the kinds of things you have? It feels like there's a, a large body of case law and statutes and, and commentary, whatever law, that it's just a matter of trying to get it, right? We It's out there. It's just hard to access. And we would love to be able to do it in a more convenient way. Are there sort of other horizons or other other things that we would love to be able to get to that we can't currently get to? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's everything. And it's not just can you get it, but are there standards? Mm-hmm. For example, you know, if, if we get a particular uh, opinion in a particular case, there isn't even a standard for identifying courts. Um, and that seems right. trivial, but it's it and it is a little bit trivial, like you can work around this. But at the same time, every startup that we talk to, every librarian, when they do projects with the data, everybody has to deal with the same stupid problem. What are what identifier are we going to use for the court? Mm-hmm. And there isn't a good answer right yet. <laughs> and th- there isn't. I mean, we we publish something and we encourage people to use it. But I wasn't even going to going to mention it because not that many people use it. And most people solve the problem themselves when they when gotcha. they cross that road. Hmm. But it starts at the top, right? It starts at like just identify a court <laughs> and then you can go down from there. Right. Can you identify an opinion? That sounds easy, but citations are not unique and neither are case names. Case names can have a ton of variety based on abbreviations, and they even change. For example, right. uh, when the attorney general changes, the case name can change. Well, and I th- wasn't there a bit of controversy over the Supreme Court just revising opinions over time? Yep. Yep. Um, I think Scalia, if I remember right, at some point he forgot to put the word no uh, in a particular <laughs> sentence. <laughs> and as you can imagine, that had predictable results, and they, yeah. you know rushed to get out a correction hmm. um, and the Supreme Court uh, to be fair that since then they they've gotten some pressure and they're doing a great job they have like a corrections page you can go and get the most recent version you can find the old versions it's great but I think that's the only court in the country that's doing anything like that so how should we think about and I know this kind of so free law project is called free law project but it's more about free as in openness and it always seems to me, I, I'm, you know, I, I love open source. Uh, I'm on information wants to be free team, but it also seems to me that that free is in somewhat in some tension with openness, right? Like, especially when it comes to independent projects uh, and and kind of in the legal hacker world, there seems to be an, an ethos sometimes of information wants to be free, my code needs to be free, my work needs to be free, and other people should just give me money for it. But that doesn't feel sustainable or scalable. And so I'm wondering how you think about the tension between free and open and and how you go about charging for free law projects so that it can be sustainable and scalable while being open. Yeah, there's totally a tension here. And, you know, we've got free right in our name. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so it's this old saw about like, you know, is it free as in beer or free as in speech? Yeah. Right. And we are coming up on our 10th anniversary doing this sort of work and there are bills to pay. Right. If you want good things, you have to pay for them. And I think that's just something we have to accept. You can't build a database of millions of opinions, oral arguments, or even just have the server hardware for that stuff without money. Mm-hmm. And so how do you how do you sort of walk that line between like, you know, we're a nonprofit. So our goal is not the money. It's it's, you know, we're very we're extremely mission driven and it's all about, you know, how do we find innovation? Um, how do we share the data with the people who need it? But at the end of the day, if we don't exist because we didn't charge any money, then we failed at our mission too. Right. So um, we do a lot of sliding scale pricing where if you come in and you're like a student researcher, great, like go for it. And, you know, that costs us money. If we give somebody free access to our servers, that costs us money. I mean, we're used to thinking of things like there's almost no marginal cost to a new Gmail account or something. And that's why Google gives it away for free. Right. But that's not that's not really true, especially at the scale of, you know, like a database of law right. where there are storage costs and there are access bandwidth costs and there's the maintenance cost that goes into working it. And the marginal cost of an additional account may not be that much, but if somebody is using that account to download dozens or hundreds or thousands of things, then it goes up pretty fast. 
Yeah, I mean, we average 240,000 requests, like API requests per day. That's not even including requests to our front end yeah. over the last 10 days right now. And that costs money. We just bought a new server that costs $15,000. That costs <laughs> money, right? That's got to come from somewhere. So yeah, it's a there's a real tension there between like, how do we how do we solve this problem and, you know, keep people in the community working on it, right? Well, and obviously you need to, I mean, this is either a, la- a side gig or it's a day job. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's exactly it. And I've been, I've been doing this full time for years and for a long time, I wasn't collecting a salary, right. right? And I could quit now and go work for Facebook and probably make twice as much money. And that's not a good situation. That I mean, that's a problem for all nonprofits, right? For sure. Yeah. They, they almost never pay what you could get outside of the nonprofit area. But yeah, it's a, it's a real tension. So we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors when we come back. I want to shift focus slightly, although I think some of the same issues are in play, and talk about the pending lawsuit against Pacer, which hopefully the listeners know about. But if not, we're going to give you an update and talk about the issues. So we'll be right back. Legal research is too expensive, hard to use, and time-consuming. It doesn't have to be. With Case Text, you can save $2,000 and 210 hours on legal research this year. Case Text has unique artificial intelligence technology that does a lot of the research for you. Just drag and drop a complaint or brief, and you'll quickly find cases on the same facts, legal issues, and jurisdiction. Case Text is fast, well-designed, and comprehensive, and it's very affordable. Go to casetext.com slash lawyerist to get case text for $55 a month. Case text is modern legal research trusted by over 3,000 small firms and 40 firms in the AmLaw 200. Go to casetext.com slash lawyerist to get started. If you have a small business or know someone who does, you probably know that small business owners wear a lot of hats, and some of those hats are totally great. But some, like filing taxes and running payroll, for example, are not so great. That's where Gusto comes in. Gusto makes payroll, taxes, and HR easy for small businesses. Fast, simple payroll processing, benefits, and expert HR support all in one place. Gusto automatically pays and files your federal, state, and local taxes so you don't have to worry about it. Plus, they make it easy to add on health benefits and even 401ks for your team. Those old-school, clunky payroll providers just weren't built for the way modern small businesses work. But Gusto is, so let them wear one of your many hats. You have better things to do. Listeners get three months free when they run their first payroll. Try a demo and see for yourself at gusto.com slash lawyerist. That's gusto.com slash lawyerist. In business, reputation is everything. And while online reviews can make or break you, your best clients probably aren't showing up. And that's too bad, because if they did, you'd have more clients, more referrals, and be the top-rated law firm in your area. If you're tired of waiting for reviews to trickle in, you have a choice. Either keep waiting or get proactive with Podium. Podium helps you get more reviews on the sites that matter most. Use their messaging platform to give friendly reminders while sending clients straight to the review sites that you care about the most. With Podium's built-in analytics, you can set goals, monitor progress, and incentivize your team to reach out to more clients. Become the number one choice online. Visit podium.com slash lawyerist to save 10% when you start. That's podium.com slash lawyerist to get started and save 10%. Okay, we're back. So, Mike, tell us about the Pacer lawsuit or collection of lawsuits, I think. Um, What's going on? Why has it just gotten more interesting and what are the, you know, how do we think about it? Yeah, so um, there's two Pacer lawsuits that are going on right now. One is down in Florida, one is in D.C., but I think the one in D.C. is the one that's getting all the attention or, you know, the, the lion's share of it. And it's interesting, right? We've done a ton of work, like researching Pacer and trying to understand how much money it pulls in and why it was created the way it is. And this lawsuit is uh, is a big deal, right? It's mm-hmm. basically saying that the Congress said that the administrative office of the courts, government agency that runs Pacer, that they can charge money to sustain Pacer, Mm -hmm. to sustain Pacer. But what it turns out is that they've been pulling in somewhere around $140 million per year. It's now about $1.2, $1.3 billion that Pacer has pulled in. That's amazing, actually. (laughs) Just selling stuff online. It's a great business to have a a government (laughs) monopoly. Yeah. And so they've been doing that. And so this lawsuit basically says, no, that's not what Congress said you could do. We have evidence that you're spending the money on other things. And this is not okay. That's 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 kind of the, the outlines of it. And it's class action. So um, if you're a Pacer user, you may have gotten the, you know, you can opt out email or letter or whatever. But um, so here's my question, because like Pacer clearly is not there's not no cost to operate it. So are the lawsuits saying that Pacer should be free or that if it's not going to be free, the cost of accessing it 
needs to do a better job of mirroring the cost of hosting and providing the service? I think it's the latter. I, I think, you know, the Congress said you can charge money. So I don't think the lawsuit has grounds to say that Pacer should be free. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, there, there are definitely people saying that. We say that all the time. Uh, we think there's a, there's a lot of really good reasons Pacer should be free. And there, there's even a bill in Congress to that effect at this moment um, that we've been providing a little bit of guidance on. And yeah, it's for now, if the lawsuit wins uh, or if, you know, the side we want to win wins, mm -hmm. but it could be interesting, right? Pacer will probably still keep charging money, but... Right. If you had to guess, what would be a fair, like, I mean, you, you run a database of court in, in legal information. If you had to give a ballpark for what you think the value of a page ought to be, what would you put it at? That is the... the Best possible question for me, Sam. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, if you have heard this, but we actually did uh, expert testimony in that case. Did you? Um, okay, cool. And we went, we calculated how much would it cost, right, to run Pacer if mm -hmm. you did it on AWS um, with Amazon's hosting thing. And if you, you know, did it like with all the like high security government stuff. What did you come up with? I'm super curious. <laughs> The answer is one half of one ten thousandth of a penny per page per page. What is the total cost that you think of for operating Pacer? Uh, that number, I don't remember. We, we'd have to go pull it up from the from the docket. So wait, so I need to download 20,000 pages before the value of what I've downloaded reaches a penny? I think that's right. Yeah. I think that's right. Okay. We, we also calculated how many pages per person in the United States could be downloaded at the current revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think it was 180,000 pages per person per day would cost about $140 million per year. It was something absurd like that. So how much is the government actually charging to use Pacer? Or I'm sorry, how much is the is the government actually spending on maintaining Pacer and hosting Pacer and all that stuff? That's a good question. I think you can find that if you dig into the case. And I don't know offhand, because that, I think that's one of the big things that's uh, being argued about in the case is, mm -hmm. okay, we know we know that it brought in this much money. How much of that money was spent on Pacer? Yeah. And actually, I should mention, too, one of our big assumptions in our calculations is that Pacer is run in a somewhat sane way. That's what I'm getting at, because I seriously doubt it is. And it's not, right? <laughs> Reddit, the... Uh, Reddit, the huge, like, yeah. it's probably the fifth most popular website on the internet, something like that. It was run by, like, half a dozen people for years. Yeah. And I think that they're kind of extreme. I think they're really, really talented people. But Pacer has its own installation in every court across the country. I mean, right. It's an insane bit of software. <laughs> it's an insane bit of software, right? Like... We found a security problem that we reported in Pacer. It took six months to get every court across the country to fix a security problem. Um, and that's with us making lots of mean threats about how we're going to tell the world about the security problem. So like even when they're motivated to do just the smallest upgrade like that, it's I mean, it's government, so it's going to be slow. But it's just an insane way they run it. And it's going to be expensive to do it the way they do it. Right. But even that said, right, like. Let's say that Pacer costs $10 million to run. That's still a lot of people working full time. Well, and right? let's say it costs 10,000 times more than your estimate to run. That's still only a half a penny per page, not 10 cents a page, which is what they're charging now. <laughs> yep. And that assumes that you're off by, a you know, an 100 orders of magnitude. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's right. Well, that's kind of insane. Uh, well, <laughs> where, <laughs> obviously, you want uh, the plaintiffs in this case to win. And for Pacer to either become free or a whole lot cheaper, do you have some sense of the strength of the arguments in favor of that? It's looking pretty good. Yeah, we like the this case. There have been a number of lawsuits against Pacer over the years. This one feels a little bit different, and you know one of the reasons is the lawyers involved are top-notch lawyers, right? Uh, it's a small firm, and they bring cases to the Supreme Court on a regular basis. That's a big deal, right? It's not someone who's aggrieved at Pacer fees and wants their, you know, wants their fees returned to them or something. It's a big deal, serious lawyers. That's sort of exhibit A. Exhibit B is the strategy and the number of amicus briefs they've been able to pull in is just impressive, right? Mm -hmm. um, the strategy, first of all, they started with a veterans organization, right? Let's find a sympathetic lead plaintiff in the case. And, and they did that, right? Then they got uh, they got like Senator Lieberman to file a uh, file an amicus brief. They've got we joined in one from like technology leaders or something something along that sort of framing. And just the list of amicus just goes on and on and on and on and on. And Lieberman has to be said he's the one who created the law uh, that said that Pacer could charge money. 
So here mm-hmm. you've got the guy who sponsored the original law saying, you're not doing this right. Yeah. I think it's going to be pretty hard for a court to look at that a different way, but I'm not a judge. And, <laughs> and after we all, see. we are asking the courts to declare that they're doing something wrong themselves. Yeah. That's been an interesting point in all the Pacer litigation is it's actually really hard to, it's really hard just to bring a case. Yeah. Not have it dismissed out of hand. Okay. So if, you know, what's your pitch for, uh, for helping Free Law Project? Um, why should, why should lawyers support it and what can they do to support it? You're a nonprofit, so I'm going to let you give your pitch here, which I wouldn't ordinarily do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, there's a number of things. One thing I always do is if you are a Pacer user, we have an extension that we haven't talked about. Let's talk about it then. It's a browser extension called Recap. It's Pacer spelled backwards. And, you know, the motto is turning Pacer around. And basically you install it in your browser, Firefox or Chrome, and then you go and use Pacer. And as you make your purchases from Pacer, you send us a copy. It just happens in the background and you'll get little notifications to say, oh, you know, you sent the docket, you sent the PDF. And we'll take those items, we'll, you know, extract the text from the PDF, we'll make it searchable, we'll put it in the API, and we'll share it with the world. You just contributed to the legal Wikipedia. So I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a moment, because I can hear the objections that, because I know what the objections are, because I've heard them before. Yep. <laughs> Should lawyers worry about their client's privacy if they're sharing documents concerning their client's that they download from Pacer and then are sharing them with a third party. Cause that's essentially what recap does. Yeah. Um, well look, the content is in Pacer. And so it's not like it's private information. If you are working with sealed information, then hell yeah. Um, you know, and recap won't pull that right. Recap is going to be good about that. Yep. And so, you know, it's, Essentially, if you use it, you're sharing data with us and it's not like it's private data. Right. And the time to worry about whether or not there's, information that is should be confidential and sealed in your documents is not after they're in pacer already but before you put them there <laughs> that's yeah that that is a nice way to put it too and um, i imagine some lawyers are like yeah but i make mistakes and that happens right lawyers do upload stuff that they shouldn't from time to time um manafort's lawyers are now infamous for that <laughs> they have yep. done it they've done it twice uh they uploaded a, a document that was improperly redacted and at some point they uploaded their internal meeting notes uh instead of the document they intended to upload mm-hmm. and when that happens people reach out to us we fix it right like we we don't want we're not in the business of messing people up right we right. want lawyers to be our friends and then and then the, the flip side of it is the benefit of using recap i believe is that it'll let you know if a document is already in the free law projects database so that you can just download it for free instead of paying for it from pacer am i right about that yeah that's right yeah thank you so yes yeah, so that's the flip side as you're using pacer it'll just put little links to anything that anybody has ever shared with us before that's awesome and you can just get that stuff for free so uh installing recap is helpful because it helps you get more stuff and add it to your database i assume you also take donations that's right yeah so um so recap is a big one donations are a big one but i think a big one too is just be aware right um if you're listening to this podcast i I get the impression you probably already know and i think you've probably heard from like sarah glassmeyer and tim stanley and ned walters and lots of free law advocates like myself sure um so yeah i mean i think step one like you know be aware of the issues be aware of, of the kinds of problems and sort of tune into that beyond you know, just doing the actual like day to day and advocate when an opportunity presents itself, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. You also wanted to talk about how courts can help. Essentially, we're talking about how hard it is to vacuum data out of the courts. What could courts be doing to help change this world? Yeah. So courts are where it starts, right? And there's a lot that courts can do, you know, like we talked about how the Supreme Court's doing a great job when uh, they amend um, opinions. Mm -hmm. Or they started doing a good job. (laughs) They are now doing a good job. Yeah. After being called out on it sufficiently, yeah. I think I think that required a Twitter bot. Somebody mm-hmm. started tweeting every time they changed something. But yeah, so I mean, I think the big picture is courts need to think of one of their big roles as being a publisher and think a little bit more like a librarian might. It's not just about finding justice in a particular case, but it's also about if you're going to rely on precedent, that precedent needs to be available and the courts need to take some responsibility for for that. They need to put it online. They need to have good metadata along with it when they put it online. And they, they need to think about durability, right? Like um, some courts will put up the most recent 50 items and then it falls off the bottom and you're like, wait, where'd that other one, you know, right. like it didn't have a permalink. What? I linked to that. Now it's gone, right? It's, it's sort of basic stuff in some ways, but, you know, 
one place this has kind of come to a head, or maybe not a head, but people are pushing pretty hard on this, are the um, the library at Harvard Law School. They went and scanned their entire library. Like, all of their books are now scanned. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, and they have this actual pretty cool agreement. You know, there, there's a licensing problem with the content for now because they, you know, it's this whole money problem, right? Right. So they scanned everything. Um, it was paid for by a for-profit organization, and that for-profit organization, which now got bought by Lexis, has a monopoly on the data for now. But if the court steps up and starts doing, I think it's like half a dozen small things, like providing a citation to an item when they publish it, putting it on their website, if they do like half a dozen small things, they can unlock a digital copy of all of Harvard's opinions from that jurisdiction. Right. Just like that. That's all they have to do. If they check these boxes, suddenly the entire case law for that jurisdiction becomes available online for free. And that's incredible. And we just need them to do that little bit. <laughs> yeah, so Harvard is working hard on that. They're, they're leading on that initiative, which is great. And I think they've got, I don't know, maybe half a dozen jurisdictions so far, right? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of sad. It's not, a, it's not a high bar, but they've set a bar and now we just have to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Mike, is there anything I failed to ask you about free law, the free law project, um, open access, uh, the pace for litigation that I should have and that we should talk about before we close? No, I think that's a great, I think it's been a great conversation. Fantastic. Mike, thanks so much for being with us on the podcast today. It's been my pleasure. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Thank you.